Hey everyone, let's talk about hemorrhage and oxygenation. So we're going to start this talk off with a bunch of nerdy science stuff. Then we're going to move on to some applied nerdy science stuff. And then towards the end, we're going to get to some actual EMS stuff. So I like to start these talks talking about the lethal trauma triad. And so we know that for, uh, for trauma patients, what we're really concerned about is bleeding. And blood can be thought of, among many other things, as the radiator of the body. So it carries, uh, it carries heat from heat-producing organs to non-heat-producing organs, and it sort of keeps our body the same temperature all the time. And if we start losing blood, then we start losing some of that heat. And when we lose heat, we get hypothermic. And the more we bleed, the colder we get. Now, hypothermia is bad for a lot of reasons. It's not just uncomfortable. Uh, it has some effects on the blood. So one of the first things we see is when you cool off enough, your platelets will stop sticking together. They're going to stop uh, forming those clots or slow down the, the clot formation. And as you get colder, the other components of your clotting mechanism stop producing clots. Now, when coagulation inside the blood is broken, we call that coagulopathy. So pathy, you stick that term on any word and you break it. So if you're a psychopath, you have a broken psyche. In this case, the coagulo is pathic. So coagulopathy is broken coagulation or broken clotting. So obviously we know that if you're bleeding, not being able to form a clot is probably pretty bad. And that leads to more bleeding, which leads to more hypothermia and more coagulopathy. And you can see that we're starting to establish a cycle of badness here. But that's not all. So one of the other things that happens when you're bleeding is that you lose red blood cells. And red blood cells have an essential role in transporting oxygen to the tissues of the body. And so we know that when the tissues of the body uh, don't get enough oxygen, you go into uh, a a metabolic process that produces a lot of acid. And the buildup of acid inside the body is called acidosis. Now, like hypothermia, acidosis has some bad effects on the blood. First, we're going to see that the clots that we started forming in the beginning begin to degrade as the level of acid goes up in the body, or the pH goes down. And then we see that as the pH continues to go down, as the amount of acid in the body continues to increase, that we don't make new clots. So we can't make new clots because it's too acidic, which leads to more bleeding, which leads to more acidosis. And the cycle continues. But wait, it gets worse. So when we are cold, we start to shiver. When you shiver, you activate the muscles of your body, which then require oxygen. If there's not enough oxygen, then we build more acid. But as acid goes up, the response to nerve signals from the brain to shiver is blunted. So the bodies just can't, um, they can't produce the motion to shiver anymore. And so we get colder. And we can see here that if allowed to continue bleeding, our patient's gonna get more hypothermic and more acidotic which is gonna to lead to a um, breaking of the, the blood clotting system, which is gonna to lead to more bleeding. And if you've ever seen this in real life, you start an IV on one of these people and the blood will actually leak around the catheter. There are surgeons who talk about in the old days, back before we knew how to fix this, where they'd go to throw a suture inside of a traumatized patient and the blood would just weep around the suture and they just could not keep this person from bleeding out. And now we, we know a little bit why. And there's other factors that go into this, but this is really important. And I, I start off my lectures with this concept because everything we're gonna talk about comes back to this. So let's zoom in on the acidosis portion of this and let's talk a little bit about metabolism. So if you ask someone what metabolism is, they may say, oh, that's the thing where you, you burn fat and you burn carbs and it makes energy. And you're not wrong. Metabolism, the, the technical definition, is the sum total of all the chemical reactions that happen inside the body. But what we're specifically talking about is we're talking about the energy production within a cell. And so when we talk about the metabolism within a cell, we specifically are talking about two processes, uh, one and then the other. And those two processes are 
first was called glycolysis, and this is the breaking down of sugar. So you can see that glyco refers to glucose or sugar, and lysis, anytime you see lysis, you know that a process is breaking it down. And so what glycolysis does is it breaks apart sugar and makes a bunch of chemicals that are important to feed into the mitochondria, which we all know is the powerhouse of the cell. And so the mitochondria take these chemicals, but they require oxygen. They require oxygen. So we have a bunch of oxygen. We feed it through this process. And with everything that we have, we produce energy, water, and the waste byproduct of carbon dioxide. And this is called aerobic metabolism. And if everything's going well, we breathe the, the carbon dioxide out when we, when, we, um, when we breathe out, and we replace it with new oxygen when we breathe in. But sometimes we don't have enough oxygen. And this is actually a pretty common occurrence when you're working out or when there's a high demand on a, a specific tissue. They may not have all the oxygen they need right now, but your body will eventually compensate. So for right now, we feed this sugar into glycolysis and it breaks apart, but the mitochondria doesn't have enough oxygen to do its part. And so what happens is we make a little bit of energy, but we mostly make byproducts that get transformed into lactic acid. And the longer we go without enough oxygen for the mitochondria to work, the more lactic acid we build up. This is called anaerobic metabolism. Now this may be familiar if you've gone for a run or you've worked out heavily and your muscles are achy and sore. The thing that makes them sore is the buildup of acid. Now, in a normal, healthy, functioning body, we can increase our respiratory rate, we can blow off this acid as we breathe, and our body pH won't change significantly. But if we're traumatized, then the game changes. So let's, let's define a few things as we move forward. So shock We've always been told in our, in our EMT textbooks that shock is the failure of oxygen delivery to the cells. And this is true, but I'm going to advance your understanding a little bit. So shock is a pathophysiological state in the body that occurs when oxygen delivery is uh, insufficient to meet the demands of the cell. So failure to meet oxygen delivery, I'm sorry, failure to meet oxygen demand of the cells. That is what shock is. This is often, but not always, a result of dropping cardiac output. So when we talk about shock, we can divide it into a lot of different categories. But for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to focus on hypovolemic shock, and hypovolemic shock specifically because of trauma. I think while it's conceptually easy to appreciate, it's important to have a deeper qualitative and quantitative understanding of shock um, and it will drive your resuscitation strategies, and it will also drive your outcomes when it relates to a failure of the blood. So let's move forward and let's talk about cardiac output. So cardiac output is defined as heart rate times stroke volume. So specifically, uh, the stroke volume of your left ventricle, which is about 150 milliliters of blood um, in an, a normal uh, a normal adult, um, but only a fraction of that blood is actually ejected from the left ventricle. So about 60 or 70 percent of that uh, 150 milliliters is going to be ejected with each beat of the heart. And this of course depends on the contractile strength of the heart, so how hard the heart is beating affects how much, uh, how much fluid is ejected out. It also depends on other factors like the ventricles need to be primed by the atria. So when the atria squeeze, it pushes a little bit more blood in the ventricles, gets a little bit of a squeeze on that muscle, and allows the heart to beat more forcefully. So all of these uh, factors play into how much blood is ejected. Um, if we multiply that by the number of times per minute the heart does this, then we get a cardiac output. And a normal cardiac output is somewhere between four and eight liters of blood. So roughly every minute you'll cycle about the amount of blood that is present in your body, give or take. Now, if our cardiac output drops, then we start seeing a drop in blood pressure. So let's talk about what blood pressure is. So blood pressure is the cardiac output 
times the systemic vascular resistance. And what is systemic vascular resistance? Well, your heart is pushing blood out through a big, huge artery called the aorta. But eventually, the aorta slims down, it splits off and branches off into a bunch of little arteries, and then arterioles, and then the capillary beds. And this creates a lot of resistance. When you're trying to push blood into a, a smaller space, uh, that smaller space is going to push back. And so we're pushing blood towards the body, but the body is pushing back at us. And the resulting pressure in between is our blood pressure. So why is blood pressure important? Well, blood pressure is important because of something called hydrostatic pressure. And anyone who's been to fire academy or been to uh, firefighter pump training will be very comfortable with the idea of hydrostatic pressure. But basically, hydrostatic pressure is the pressure within a fluid at rest. So you have a hose connected to your fire engine, you uh, turn on the pump, and it pressurizes the line, and you haven't opened the nozzle yet. Um, if you go and you feel that hose, it's going to be very stiff, very hard, um, and that's because the water inside that hose is pressing equally on every surface at every point in that hose. Uh, the pressure isn't higher closer to the pump, um, and it isn't lower closer to the nozzle. Now that all changes when you open up that nozzle and the dynamic changes. So inside your blood vessels, you have the same sort of system. So it is a closed container up until you get traumatized. It's a closed container. And closer to your heart, you have these big wide vessels and the blood pressure exceeds what's called your osmotic pressure. Now osmotic pressure is a, is a chemical term and it basically just means that the stuff dissolved in your blood has its own pressure. And we know that half the blood is your red blood cells, but the other half of your blood is plasma. And in plasma is a bunch of proteins and a bunch of electrolytes, and they're all dissolved, and they sort of generate their own pressure. And if our blood pressure is greater than this pressure, then we can start pushing uh, fluid and pushing electrolytes and pushing oxygen and things like that out of the blood vessels into the tissues. And this is a really important fundamental reason why blood pressure is so important. And then, you know, as it passes through the capillaries, on the other side of the capillaries, after this sort of bottleneck that is the, the capillaries and, and the, the delivery of oxygen to the tissues, we see that the blood pressure is less than the osmotic pressure of the tissues. And so we know that fluid follows the, the, um, the solute right? So the, the stuff that's dissolved in your blood, your body is going to naturally move fluid to create an equilibrium. And so we see that fluid and with it, a lot of the waste products from the cells flow back into the blood vessels on the side of the veins. And this is how your blood works normally. This is how the, the blood pumping out of your heart delivers oxygen to your cells and how the blood returning to your heart is, um, uh, devoid or not devoid but has less oxygen and is carrying more co2 so that you can breathe it out back in your lungs all right so we talked about some nerdy science stuff we made some definitions we talked about what a bunch of fundamental principles are now let's apply some of these scientific principles to the uh, the function of the body so the first thing that I want to talk about is the cycle of shock in the body and specifically we're talking about hemorrhagic shock here so as we begin to bleed we lose volume as a response to losing volume and also as a response to bleeding uh, we decrease cardiac output now our body has a couple of ways to compensate for the loss of or for decreased cardiac output and there's too many two primary pathways and together, these pathways form what's called the compensatory mechanism. So in EMT class, we talk about uh, compensated shock and how your body can compensate for a certain amount of shock, but then um, you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to see the blood pressure start going down. So initially, uh, what's going to happen is the body's going to release a bunch of hormones. This is your epinephrine and your norepinephrine, and that's, these are hormones called catecholamines. And they have the effect of both constricting the vessels uh, outside the heart. So remember that blood pressure 
is the amount of fluid that your heart is pushing out times the um, peripheral vascular resistance. So if we have hormones that are clamping down on those peripheral blood vessels, we're going to see our blood pressure start to go up. These catecholamines also work on the heart and they increase your heart rate and also increase the forcefulness that your heart is contracting with. So we go back to cardiac output and we know that stroke volume times heart rate, we know that our heart rate is going up, we know that our stroke uh, contractility is more forceful and we know that our peripheral blood vessels are clamped down and so all of this is going to have the effect of increasing your cardiac output and your blood pressure. So likewise on the other side this other pathway we have here is the fluid shift. So we talked about hydrostatic pressure and we talked about that as your blood pressure drops so we're going to see fluid um, go into the vasculature. So as uh, cardiac output decreases, as blood pressure drops, we're going to see fluid sucked in from the outside, uh, outside of the blood vessels. So the cells and the interstitial fluid is going to flow into the blood vessels. We're also going to see the release of more hormones. These are from the pituitary gland in the brain. And so vasopressin is also called antidiuretic hormone, and that's going to decrease the amount of fluid that the kidneys are going to create uh, or going to put into your urine. And the other one is aldosterone and this one is a sodium sparing hormone. And so we know that water likes to follow salt and so if your kidneys are preserving and, and uh, not releasing salt that it's going to cause a lot of fluid to not be filtered into urine. And so both of these hormones create um, the kidneys preserving fluid and not dumping fluid into your into your bladder. Um, also at the same time you're going to have organs like the spleen and the liver start to release uh, blood and, and plasma. So the spleen is going to release red blood cells that are immature and so while these blood cells weren't necessarily ready to enter systemic circulation we need them right now. And so this, uh, the spleen is going to dump all of these immature blood cells out into the blood. At the same time, the liver is to going to disgorge a bunch of, uh, of fluid and proteins and things like that. What we see in plasma, it's going to release a lot of plasma. This has the net effect of increasing the circulating volume. And so we know that stroke volume times heart rate, our first pathway up here increased your heart rate. The second pathway here increased the volume and that has the net effect of compensating for your decreased cardiac output. But we get to the question, is our, com our compensatory mechanism making up for the amount of fluid that we lost? If it is, then we're going to increase cardiac output and we're back to where we started, except, you know, not as good. Um, and then if we haven't stopped the volume loss, then we're going to continue to decrease cardiac output, but we're going to continue to release all these mechanisms until our compensatory mechanism is exhausted. And once it's exhausted, we see that cardiac output continues to decline. Now this leads to, like we said, uh, decreased blood pressure. And we know that decreased blood pressure causes a decrease in the amount of oxygen being pushed across those vessel walls into the blood or into the tissues. And we know that when tissues can't get oxygen, they go into a metabolism that is very wasteful. And eventually, this leads to death. So let's talk about a little bit about how blood actually works, and specifically how the red blood cells, and specifically how the hemoglobin in red, bl red blood cells works. So here we see a red blood cell, it's cut in half. Inside this red blood cell we have just tons and tons and tons of these tiny little proteins called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a really interesting protein. Uh, hemoglobin is a molecule which uses a little bit of iron, uh, uh, a single atom of iron, to reversibly bind to oxygen. right? And so each of these four little groups that sort of hinge around each other use that iron to reversibly attract that oxygen. Now what's interesting is that this molecule changes shape under different chemical conditions, right? So these four pieces sort of hinge back and forth on each other and changes shape 
um, based on a few things that we'll talk about in just a second. And why that's important is that when this thing folds up, it causes oxygen to eject off or not bind. It closes off these iron and, and prevents iron from binding to oxygen. Um, or uh, it opens up based on the chemical conditions and allows oxygen to jump on there. So some of the things that affect this are temperature, the amount of acid in the blood, and the amount of this chemical called 2,3-BPG, or DPG, depending on the textbook that you read. So um, the things that, that open it up and cause oxygen to stick onto the iron is if it's cold, if it's alkaline, which means that there's not a lot of acid in the area, and if there's not a whole lot of this chemical called 2,3-BPG, which we'll talk about in just a second. Where in the body do we find cold, alkaline blood? Well, as blood flows through the, the lungs, the lungs are air-cooled. The air we breathe in is usually a little bit less warm than the body, and so we're cooling off the blood as it passes through the lungs. This has the effect of opening up that molecule a little bit. Also, the, one of the primary functions of the lungs, besides getting oxygen into our body, is getting these waste products out of our body. And so we blow off our CO2, the, release that carbonic acid, and decrease the, P, or, uh, decrease the acidity of the blood. The pH goes up as the acid is blown away. And this has the effect of, again, opening up this molecule so that more oxygen can bind. And then that BPG. So BPG stands for bis, uh, bisphosphoglycerate or diphosphoglycerate, depending on the textbook. And this is a byproduct of that glycolysis mechanism that we talked about earlier. It's just something that's made when, uh, when glycolysis happens. And so we find this in great numbers around more metabolically active tissue. And we find it in, uh, in fewer numbers in less metabolically active tissue. So the tissue of the lungs is not really that metabolically active. It's very, very thin cells, and it's really designed to just act as a barrier between the wet and, and oxygenated inside of the alveoli and the, uh, and the blood cells that surround each alveoli. So not a whole lot of BPG up in the lungs. And this is important because up in the lungs is where we want oxygen to stick onto this red blood cell. Now we go over to the other side and we know that as blood circulates back towards the body um, that we have uh, an increase in the heat, right? We get into the body, the core of the body, it's much warmer there. Uh, we get closer to the muscle cells, they're producing a lot of heat. And this causes this protein to fold in on itself, what we call a conformational change. And so it gets hot, it folds, one of those oxygens pops off. Um, also, this more metabolically active tissue produces a lot more acid. Like we talked about, if we're not meeting oxygen demand, or if they haven't gotten their share of the oxygen yet, they're going to produce a little bit more acid, a little bit more waste carbon dioxide, maybe some lactic acid. As the acidity goes up, then we're going to fold this protein a little bit more, and it's going to pop another acid off. And then finally, uh, as we flow through the blood vessels, we'll see that we'll find an increase in BPG as the demand for oxygen goes up. Folds a little bit more, oxygen pops off a little bit more. And that's mechanically how hemoglobin works inside your blood cells. Now, let's put this, let's visualize this on a chart. So on the vertical axis here, we have the percent of oxygen that's hooked on to this hemoglobin. And this is expressed in a percent. So you can think of this a lot like our pulse oximeter or SpO2, right? You have 100% at the top and 0% at the bottom. Now along the bottom side, we have the total oxygen that's available to cells. And this is expressed as PO2 or um, the pressure of oxygen. And this is actually um, expressed as millimeters of mercury. This is not something that you're going to measure inside of an ambulance. This is something that we would get on an arterial blood gas or something like that. And this is measured starting at zero and it goes way, way up into the hundreds. But for the purposes of this, we're gonna look at that 80 mark. So where it goes from green to yellow, that's sort of the threshold of okay. And so if we uh, 
if we look at this, we would think that there's a direct relationship that if you increase the amount of oxygen that is attached to the blood, then obviously there's going to be more oxygen available to the cells. Well, that's not true. It looks a little bit more like this. And that's because of those chemical reactions that we talked about before, the, the changing shape and the amount of acidity and the temperature of the blood. This line fluctuates back and forth and creates this sigmoidal curve that we see here, this S-curve. So if we draw some lines on this, right? let's draw a line starting at 80. That's at the bottom side of good on that lower axis. We see that if we draw the line over, it goes to about 95% that's pretty good. I'm not going to put oxygen on this patient if their SpO2 reads 95%. I may keep an eye on it, but for now, they're oxygenating just fine. Now, if we draw another set of lines going from 60, so this is in sort of that concerning area, let's draw a set of lines there, and we see, okay, now their oxygen's at 91%, and I'm going to put oxygen on this person. This person needs a nasal cannula or something like that, just to get a little bit more oxygen on their blood. Now, if we move that line down to 40, so we're moving it the same amount of space on the bottom, we see that there's a significantly higher or a significant drop in the, in the percentage of oxygen along that curve. The curve starts to steepen and we start to really lose ground. So now our patient's around 75%. And this is really concerning. If I have a patient at 75%, this person is not oxygenating effectively. And I really need to be a little bit more aggressive about how I take care of this person's ventilation and oxygenation. Now, like I said before, depending on the conditions in the body, this line is going to shift around. So as we get closer to the inside of the body, closer to the cells that need oxygen, we see a rightward shift of this line. So temperature goes up, the amount of acid goes up, the amount of this BPG goes up, and we see blood uh, start to eject oxygen molecules off of the hemoglobin and deliver that oxygen to the tissues, and that's a good thing. On the other side, as it gets closer to the lungs, we see that the temperature goes down, the blood becomes more alkaline, the amount of BPG present decreases and oxygen wants to stick to the blood, right? So this line goes back and forth as blood flows around the body and the chemical conditions change. But we can also see that in a traumatized patient, we have simultaneously uh, an increase of acid, which makes oxygen not want to stick to the blood when it's in the lungs, and a decrease in temperature, which makes the oxygen not want to leave the hemoglobin as it circulates around to the tissues. And it doesn't counteract each other. It doesn't, high acid doesn't counteract low temperature. It actually breaks the blood in those two different ways and completely changes the way oxygen is delivered to the tissues. At this point, your blood is broken. All right, so where are we? scientifically, what have, we, what have we determined is true? Well, we determined that if you're bleeding, you're going to get cold and you're going to start to build up the amount of acid inside your blood. Now, we just determined that if your blood is cold and your blood is acidic, that you're going to have problems carrying oxygen around your body. It's just not going to work. Okay, so let's go into the concept of oxygen debt. And what is oxygen debt? So we can think of this as an accumulation of ischemia over time. And remember that ischemia is a condition that occurs when oxygen is blocked from getting to a tissue. And in this case, we have hypoxic ischemia where we just uh, don't have the oxygen attached to the blood cells and, and the oxygen that's in the blood cells is just not being released to the tissue. So the longer we stay in that time, the more oxygen debt that we're going to accumulate. So what does this look like? Well, on the vertical axis here, we have a relative level of, of oxygen. And along the bottom of the chart here, we see the amount of time that the patient is with us in the ambulance. So we're going to talk about VO2. And what is VO2? VO2 is the tissue oxygen consumption. 
And if you're into working out or if you read workout magazines instead of working out, you may have seen the term VO2 max. And that's the maximum amount of oxygen that you can uh, consume in a cell. You can think of it as your, your cell efficiency when it comes to processing oxygen to create energy. So VO2 is the tissue oxygen consumption. That's the demand at the tissue level. Now, we can't talk about demand unless we talk about supply. So we have the concept of delivered oxygen, or DO2. And this is the amount of oxygen that we're able to attach to the blood cells and circle around to the body. We use our cardiac output, we use our blood pressure, we use that hydrostatic pressure to deliver this oxygen to the tissues so that the tissues will always have enough oxygen to make energy. Now, when things are impaired, when we're not circulating well, when our blood pressure is going down, when our blood is cold and acidic, all of a sudden we're not able to meet demand. And we can see as soon as that red line crosses that blue line, that area under the curve, that whole area is shock. This is our failure to meet the metabolic demands of the tissue. So the distance between the the blue line and the red line. So the distance between the demand for oxygen and the ability to get that oxygen to the cell, that is your oxygen deficit, right? And this whole area is your oxygen debt. And just like debt in the real world, um, more debt is bad. And the deeper in debt you go, the harder it is to recover. And anyone who goes deep into debt generally doesn't come out the same way that they went in and at least not as happy as they were when they went into debt. So we see here that the red line bottoms out and it starts to go back up. So at this point, we can assume that we've stopped the bleeding, that the body's compensatory mechanism is kicking in, and they have all these hormones being released and their heart is working and you know they're breathing really hard and um, maybe a well-meaning paramedic comes along, starts an IV and gives them some salt water which doesn't really do anything good. It does a lot of bad things, and it only increases the blood pressure a little bit. And we can see that over time, they start to pull out of this oxygen debt, right? But there's still a huge amount of area under this curve. And we're gonna talk in a little bit about the, the long-term effects of allowing someone to accumulate oxygen debt. But we can see that this is not a great situation. Now, if we jump in early, if we have an early intervention. So um, we, we correct some of these things that makes the oxygen break, um, the, uh, the cold blood, the acidic blood. Maybe we call a helicopter and they bring along some, some blood products. Maybe we have a whole blood on a paramedic fly car and they can come to the scene and start administering blood and sort of correcting these problems. Then, then we start to see that the amount of oxygen debt is decreased significantly. We can pull this patient out of their shock state and start meeting the demands of their tissues and really reduce the amount of time that they spend in this oxygen um, deficit and the total amount of oxygen debt that they accumulate. All right, so I promised we would. Let's talk about the effects of shock. And there's two, there's two categories of effect that I want to discuss. The general category of MODS, uh, which up until recently was called multi-organ failure. And then I'm going to drill down specifically on something called SHINE, which you can think of as a specific blood vessel failure. All right. So starting with MODS. MODS stands for Multiple Organ Dysfunction Syndrome. And uh, until recently, like I said, it was known as multiple organ failure. And the reason we don't call it failure anymore is it's not, it's not on or off. It's not your organ is working fine or it's not working at all. There are many states. There's a sliding scale of dysfunction. And the more dysfunction you have, the more unhealthy you are as a person. And so uh, if you are allowed to stay in shock for a long period of time, then you'll have increasing levels of dysfunction throughout all of the organ systems of your body. So the response to this ischemic injury is common to all cell types. Every cell in your body is going to have a common response to, uh, to hypoxia. However, 
the degree of response varies between tissue types. Certain tissues are going to respond more than other tissues. Cells with higher metabolic rates are going to eat up all of their oxygen more quickly, and they're going to go into that anaerobic metabolism. They're going to accumulate more of this metabolic waste, and they're going to accumulate it more quickly, whereas less metabolically active uh, tissues are not going to necessarily go into that anaerobic metabolism quite so quickly and may be preserved. But all of the tissues are going to have this uh, generalized ischemia. They're going to have this inflammation. And we're going to go into specifically some of the more sensitive organs. So let's start with the brain. We already know that hypoxic ischemic brain injury after cardiac arrest is a leading cause of mortality and long-term neurologic disability in the survivors of cardiac arrest. So even if we get their pulse back, even if we deliver them to the hospital and to the cath lab and they get those blood vessels opened up, if we weren't really on it with our, our CPR, if we weren't on the chest and doing high performance CPR and optimizing their airway, then even if they survive that cardiac arrest, they may not come out of that neurologically intact. And we see the same sort of thing in trauma. If we allow, if we allow them to remain in shock for a long period of time, they may not come out of it neurologically intact. We could have a, a range of side effects ranging from uh, concussion or TBI-like symptoms all the way to stroke-like symptoms, and they may not wake up at all. The heart. So we know that a myocardial infarction is a blockage of blood and thus oxygen to the tissues of the heart. And this is bad and it kills off a certain portion of the heart. Well, the uh, going into shock is like a myocardial infarction for the entire heart. And so when we look at a 12 lead EKG for someone having a heart attack, we see that a in a specific area of the heart, we can see that ST segment elevation showing us where on that 12 lead and where inside the cardiac muscle there is a blockage. Well, when we look at the EKG for someone who has been in shock, we see ST elevation everywhere. The entire heart is infarcted or is uh, deprived of oxygen. And this has the effect of weakening the muscle tissue and making this, uh, this heart pump weaker decreasing your cardiac output, increasing inflammation in the tissues of the heart, and just generally a heart that's already been struggling to keep up with this fluid loss is now put into a weakened state, and that is terrible. Moving on to the lungs. So uh, especially recently, we've heard a lot about cytokine storm and acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. Well, this is... Uh, also common in shock. Um, it may not suffer necessarily from lack of oxygen if you're ventilating this, this patient effectively, but there's going to be other indicators of distress within the body that are going to lead to an inflammatory response in the lungs. Another thing that we see in the lungs is the, um, the dysfunction of the clotting mechanism, but in the opposite direction as we're expecting. So they'll actually form microscopic clots in all of the little blood vessels that you have in your lungs. These cause uh, a microscopic pulmonary emboli, which block blood vessels from accessing the alveoli and loading up with oxygen. And so it's just a really bad situation in the lungs. And we definitely want to avoid ARDS. Moving on to the kidneys. So that same inflammatory cascade causes the lining of the blood vessels and the filtration mechanisms in the kidney to, uh, to dysfunction. And this is known as acute kidney injury. And this is another one of those things that we used to call failure. We used to call this kidney failure, but we don't call it kidney failure anymore. It's now an acute kidney injury. And that's because you may recover from this injury and be just fine. Or depending on the extent of the injury, you may wind up on dialysis. Either way, this is a bad day. You do not want to injure your kidneys. In all of these, the worst case scenario is tissue necrosis. Uh, one of the things that we also want to be concerned with is what's called reperfusion injury. So all of these organs are going to have damage done to their cells. They're going to increase the amount of acid that they produce. And at a certain point, the amount of destruction inside of a cell is going to be too much. And the cell is going to rupture. This is called apoptosis or programmed cell death. 
And when cells rupture, they're going to leak out all of the stuff inside their cells into the extracellular space and eventually into the blood vessels. These are electrolytes like potassium and uh, uh, the acids that are inside of a cell. Uh, one of the acids inside the cell is deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Yes, your DNA is acidic. It really belongs inside the cell and specifically inside the cellular envelope to keep that acid contained. So when your cell explodes, then you're leaking all of this stuff out. Now, when we resuscitate our patient, when we, when we correct some of the sources of shock, what will happen is all of this bad stuff is going to be washed back up into systemic circulation and you're going to see really bad effects on the heart and the rest of the organs that are already having a hard time. You're going to cause additional damage. All right, let's move on to shine. So I said shine is a, uh, is a dysfunction of the blood vessels. Shine stands for shock-induced endotheliopathy. And here we see that pathy again. So something is broken. The endothelium is broken. The endothelium is the inner lining of the blood vessels. And what we see on the inner lining of the blood vessels is that this is an enormous surface area. Some nerd Nick pulled out a calculator and figured out that the surface area of the inner lining of all these microscopic blood vessels in your body is close to 7,000 meters squared. And so if this were its own organ, it would be the largest organ system in the body. So that's a lot of surface area. So what is this endothelium? Well, when we look at it under a microscope, we see that it's fuzzy. It's covered with these tiny tree-like structures called glycocalyx. These glycocalyx form a forest called the pericellular matrix. Now these have a really important role. The role of the glycocalyx is to help control homeostasis between your blood plasma and the cells inside the body. This is where you're going to find enzymes with proteins responsible for everything from controlling blood pressure, for controlling clotting, and for regulating the immune system. And what they do is they, they very carefully regulate what is and is not allowed to pass through the blood vessel walls. In shock states, the combination of low blood pressure and a flood of compensatory hormones, those sympathoadrenal activations, this, this uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and vasopressin, they cause some of these things to shed off and to break off. This then allows more fluids and more cellular material, the white blood cells and all that, to uh, penetrate through the lining of the cell and to get into the body. Um, this is bad. We want to keep the fluid inside the blood vessels. And so if our blood vessels become more leaky, then we're going to start losing fluid out into the cells and not have it inside of our, our blood vessels. So our blood pressure is going to decrease further. This also triggers the release of other hormones like heparin, which is a blood thinner. And obviously, if your patient is traumatized and is starting to build those clots, releasing blood thinner into their blood is going to make everything worse. And then what we see on the long term when these patients survive is that they have a long term immune dysfunction. So these patients are just going to be low key sick for the rest of their life. All right, so we covered a lot of nerdy stuff and then we applied some of this nerdy stuff with a lot of heavy hitting charts and diagrams. Now let's go through and let's actually talk about some real EMS stuff. What can we practically do to affect any of this? Well, we're going to go back to this lethal triad. So our patient is bleeding. What can we do about that? Well, we can aggressively control hemorrhage. We can do everything that we can to find the sources of the bleeding and to stop those bleeds. We can keep our patient warm. Really aggressively turning up the heat and keeping your patient warm, really focusing on covering up and insulating, removing wet clothing, all of those things that we know how to do. Um, if you're not sweating when you're treating your trauma patients, you need to be more aggressive about treating for hypothermia. And then finally, acidosis. For all of the reasons that we've talked about, the answer to acidosis is to deliver more oxygen to these metabolic processes to decrease the amount of acid being produced and then also make sure that we're ventilating away that excess acid. 
So how do we do this? Well, brilliance in the basics is what makes you advanced. All right, we're gonna focus on the basics, opening the airway, ensuring that ventilation is adequate and delivering uh, oxygenation, making sure that our oxygenation is optimized. These are all BLS skills. And frankly, there's not a whole lot that a paramedic is going to do more than an EMT when it comes to the fundamentals of making sure that this person survives to, uh, to getting to the hospital, to getting to the OR, and really survives to hospital discharge. So airway, again, basic stuff. We're going to position our airway our head tilt, chin lift, our jaw thrust if we're concerned about spinal trauma. And there's other uh, airway positioning that we can do. We can allow the patient to assume a position of comfort, obviously injuries depending, um, and, and just do our best to optimize getting that tongue off the back of the throat, making sure that there's a clear line, of, line for oxygen to get into the lungs where it can exchange with the blood. Along with that, suctioning. Suctioning is often overlooked. You need to make sure that your suction equipment is set up, ready to go, and that that suction catheter is attached and underneath the head of the, the bed, um, ready to uh, suction up any secretions that that patient is having. And then, if necessary, insert those basic airway adjuncts, just like you were trained. All of this together will make sure that there is a path for oxygen to get into the body. Next is ventilation. If your patient needs to be ventilated, then you need to take this very seriously. We all have BVMs in our ambulances. That is absolutely certain. Most services are also going to have a PEEP valve. Many states require that a PEEP valve be included in the ambulance. The tragedy of this situation is that a BVM and a PEEP valve are a single piece of equipment that are stored in separate locations. And so if we're going to use a BVM on a patient, if we want that BVM to work, it needs to have a PEEP valve on it. The PEEP valve attaches where that arrow indicates, that cap comes off, the PEEP valve goes right on, you dial it up to starting at five centimeters of water, a lot of them will come preset like this, and you start ventilating. This is going to allow this, the lungs to expand, to stay expanded, and to maximize the surface area inside the lungs that, um, that allows oxygen to diffuse onto those blood cells. So BVM plus PEEP, it's all one word, it's one piece of equipment. And then oxygenation. So we see in this picture here that this gentleman both has a non-rebreather on and a nasal cannula on. We are optimizing the total liters that this person is, is taking in. So that non-rebreather, we can turn that up to 15, 20 liters per minute sometimes 25 liters per minute until, you know, hopefully that <laughs> it doesn't pop off, the bag doesn't pop off. So we can turn that up pretty high, but still we can deliver more oxygen. So we put that nasal cannula on there and we crank that all the way up as well. Now we learn in EMT school that the rate for a nasal cannula is anywhere between a half a liter to six liters. And this is based on long-term nasal cannula use. We're concerned about in the long term the oxygen drying out the mucous membranes of the nose and causing some long-term injury. Um, and this is the reason why you see people on low amounts of oxygen, on humidified and warmed oxygen inside the hospital. In an emergency situation, you can actually get a lot more oxygen through that nasal cannula. You can turn that thing all the way up to 10 without it being uncomfortable and, and potentially even higher. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make the maximum amount of oxygen available to those red blood cells and make every red blood cell count and every molecule of hemoglobin inside those red blood cells count so that they can deliver oxygen to the tissues and they can start reversing some of these things that has caused the blood and the coagulation uh, to break inside this patient. Now, if we need to ventilate our patient, a lot of times we think, well, it's 100% oxygen going in through that BVM every time I squeeze. Well, what's even better is if we keep that nasal cannula on and we use a BVM and a PEEP valve in order to get that, uh, that continuous flow and PEEP of oxygen inside the lungs. 
you're really optimizing your delivery of oxygenation with these techniques. And real quick, we'll, we'll hit on proning. So we've heard a lot about proning. What is it? Well, basically, as the name suggests, it's turning your patient from their back over onto their stomach. Why would anyone want to do this? Well, your heart sits in the front of your chest, and so the total surface area of the front side of your lungs is slightly less than the total surface area on the back side of your lungs. So when we turn these patients over, when they have acute respiratory distress syndrome, we are actually maximizing the surface area uh, that we use to transfer oxygen from the lungs onto the red blood cell. In practice, proning is pretty difficult to do. Um, it's difficult to do on a stable patient. Uh, generally, these patients are intubated, although we've seen over the last year, we've started pro um, proning a lot of people who weren't intubated and seeing uh, a great amount of success with that. Uh, but furthermore, when you're actively resuscitating a trauma patient, turning this patient over on their stomach, probably not a great idea, especially if you're ventilating with a BVM and PEEP valve. So is proning helpful in certain circumstances? Yes, it is. Is it practical for the purposes of trauma resuscitation? Probably not. Okay, so we started off this lecture with a bunch of nerdy stuff. We talked about the lethal trauma triad. We talked about metabolism and how that leads to a buildup of acid. We defined shock and we changed the definition of shock a little bit from what it says in the textbook. We talked about cardiac output and how that drives blood pressure. We talked about blood pressure and how that drives hydrostatic pressure. And we talked about hydrostatic pressure and how that drives oxygen into the cells. Then we went on to some applied nerdy stuff. And we talked about the mechanism of compensation within the body and the specific things that the body does in order to increase cardiac output and increase blood pressure. We talked a little bit about how blood works and how oxygen is carried and the chemical, um, uh, uh, ke the chemical factors that affect how oxygen is attached and detached from hemoglobin. And then we put that together in the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Um, and we, we, built that, uh, we built that chart up and we took a look at why that works the way it does. And then in the end, we applied all of this to what we do in the back of the ambulance, which is interrupting that lethal triad. We stop the bleeding. We optimize ventilation in order to counteract those metabolic processes, increasing the amount of uh, acid. And we keep our patient warm because we know that cold plus acid equals broken oxygen delivery um, capability. And then we went through some specific things. But remember, brilliance in the basics is what makes you advance. Thanks for your time. And I'll see you later.